Our next presenter is Dr. Paul Armstrong. He's a professor of English at Brown University. He's authored several books on literary theory and modern fiction, and recently he's turned his attention to the relation between neuroscience, reading, and narrative. His talk is called Neuroscience and Narrative. So thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this um, very exciting interdisciplinary conference. It's um, uh, really exciting to be here and to be able to um, uh, share what I've been working on in the relationship between neuroscience and narrative and also hear from multiple perspectives work in this, in this area. Um, I'll be giving a brief presentation of a model about the relationship between neuroscience and narrative that I've developed more fully in a book that is forthcoming in May from Johns Hopkins University Press, the marketing division, when they found out I was coming here, quickly put together a flyer and arranged for pre-publication with a discount. Uh, the flyer's available in your folder, and there are more flyers back there on the table if you don't have a folder. And I just got a message from the marketing division this morning saying that it's, the, it's available for on, on, on the website. So they're, uh, they're, they're eager for my talk to go well. Uh, uh, I won't directly be discussing trauma, um, but a central issue, I think, in trauma studies, from work I, I, I'm reading around it as I did over the, over the summer, uh, has to do with the relationship between the lived experience of shock or, or, or suffering or distress, uh, its neurobiological underpinnings, what happens in the brain and the body, and narration um, and narratives that either try to convey this experience or, can, or, or, or heal from it, making meaning that uh, Dr. Engdahl was talking about. And so I, my hope is that um, explaining uh, the relations between a lived experience, neuroscience, and narrative, which is what my model tries to do, could be useful uh, to many different uh, kinds of uh, trauma research from the different perspectives that are represented at the conference. So the ability to tell and follow a story requires cognitive cap capacities that are basic to the neurobiology of mental functioning. Neuroscience cannot, of course, tell us everything we might want to know about stories, but it's also the true that our species would probably not produce narratives so prolifically uh, if they weren't somehow good for our, our brains and our embodied interactions with the world. What kind of brains do we have that enable us to tell each other stories, and how do stories configure our brains? How plots order events in time, how stories imitate actions, and how narratives relate us to other lives, whether in pity or in fear. These central concerns of narratological theorists from Aristotle to Paul Ricoeur are, perhaps surprisingly, aligned with a variety of hot topics in contemporary neuroscience. Temporal synchrony, and the binding problem, the action perception circuit in cognition, and the mirroring processes of embodied intersubjectivity. The processes through which stories coordinate time, represent embodied action, and promote social collaboration are fundamental to the brain-body interactions through which our species has evolved and has constructed the cultures that we inhabit. Triangulating our phenomenological experience as tellers and followers of stories with neuroscientific findings about embodied cognition and with narrative theories about plots, fiction, and reading is an attempt to understand the relation between language, cognition, and narrative, a goal that many thoughtful investigators across a variety of disciplines have pursued. One of the reasons why philosophers, literary theorists, and everyday readers have wondered about why and how we tell stories is that narrative has seemed to hold the key to how language in the mind works. In the first part of my talk, I'll lay out a neurobiological model of narrative that explains how stories arise from and set in motion fundamental neuronal and cortical processes. And then in the second part, I'll try briefly to suggest how narrative theory should be aligned to the best current science about language and the brain. So part one, the neuroscience of narrative. Stories help the brain negotiate the never-ending conflict between its need for pattern, synthesis, and constancy on the one hand, and for flexibility, adaptability, and change on the other. All right. The brain's remarkable, paradoxical ability to play in a to-and-fro manner 
between these competing imperatives is a consequence of its decentered organization as a network of reciprocal, top-down, bottom-up connections among its interacting parts. Narrative theorist Seymour Chapman attributes plot formation to the disposition of our minds to hook things together. As he notes, our minds inveterately seek structure. This is indeed a basic axiom of contemporary neuroscience. Against the cognitive need for consistency, however, the psychologist William James describes the brain as an organ whose natural state is one of unstable equilibrium, constantly fluctuating in ways that enable its possessor to adapt his conduct to the minutest alterations in the environing circumstances. The brain knows the world by forming and dissolving assemblies of neurons, establishing the patterns that through repeated firing become our habitual ways of interacting with the environment. Even as ongoing fluctuations in these syntheses combat their tendency to rigidify and promote new cortical connections. The brain's ceaseless balancing act between the formation and dissolution of patterns makes possible the exploratory play between past equilibria and the indeterminacies of the future that is essential for successful mental functioning and the survival of our species. Stories contribute to this balancing act by playing with consonance and dissonance. Borrowing Frank Kermode's well-known terms, Paul Ricoeur describes emplotment as concordant discordance, a synthesis of the heterogeneous that configures parts into a whole by transforming the diversity of events or incidents into a coherent story. According to Ricoeur, the act of composing plots converts the existential burden of discordance into narrative syntheses that give meaning to life's imbalances by constructing patterns of action. Even in the simplest narratives that approach what Gerard Jeanette calls the hypothetical zero degree of difference between the order of events in the telling and their order in the told, the conjunctions that join together the elements of the plot are invariably disrupted by twists and turns on the way to resolution. What Jeanette calls temporal anachronies, flash forwards and flashbacks, for example, that disrupt the temporal correspondence between the telling and the told, further play with the competing impulses toward consonance and dissonance that are basic to narrative. The imbalances between pattern formation and dissolution in the brain make possible this narrative interaction between concord and discord, even as the construction and disruption of patterns in the stories we tell each other help the brain negotiate the conflicting imperatives of order and flexibility. The neuroscience of these interactions is part of the explanation of how stories give shape to our lives, even as our lives give rise to stories. Stories can draw on experience, transform it into plots, and then reshape the lives of listeners and readers because different processes of figuration traverse the circuit of interactions and exchanges that constitute narrative activity. First, the neural underpinnings of narration start with the peculiarly decentered temporality of cognitive processes across the brain, and the body, disjunctions in the timing of intracortical and brain-body interactions that not only make possible, but also actually require the kind of retrospective and prospective pattern formation entailed in the narrative ordering of beginnings, middles, and ends. Next, the strangely pervasive involvement of processes of motor co cognition not only in the understanding of action and gesture, but also in other modalities of perception, suggests why the work of creating plots 
that simulate structures of action can have such a profound effect on our patterns of configuring the world. Finally, if stories can promote empathy and otherwise facilitate the co-intentionality required for the collaborative activity unique to our species, the power and the limits of their capacity to transform social life ultimately depend on embodied processes of doubling self and other through mirroring, simulation, and identification. Processes whose limitations are reflected in the strengths and weaknesses of narratives as ethical and political instruments. In each of these areas, and I'll be talking briefly about each of them in the next few minutes, narratives configure lived experience by invoking brain-based processes of pattern formation that are fundamental to the neurobiology of mental functioning. First, the concordant discordance of emplotment is based on the decentered, asynchronous temporality of the brain. It's about to sign me out. No, I don't want to do that. There we go. One of the many ways in which the brain differs from a computer is that its temporal processes are not instantaneous and perfectly synchronized. Unlike electrical signals that discharge simultaneously at nearly the speed of light, action potentials at the neuronal level take more than a millisecond to fire, and different regions of the cortex respond at varying rates. For example, as neuroscientist Samar Zeki observes, in the visual cortex, color is perceived before motion by approximately 80 milliseconds, and locations are perceived before colors, which are perceived before orientations. The integration of neuronal processes through which conscious awareness emerges may require up to half a second. As Zeki points out, however, this binding, as it is called, is itself not perfectly homogeneous. The binding of color to motion occurs after the binding of color to color or motion to motion because binding between attributes takes longer than binding within attributes. More time is needed to integrate inputs from vision and hearing, for example, than to synthesize visual signals alone. Although we typically don't notice these disjunctions, the non-simultaneity of the brain's cognitive processes means that consciousness is inherently out of balance and always catching up with itself. As the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio puts it, we are probably late for consciousness by about 500 milliseconds, or half a second. This imbalance is not a bad thing, however, because it allows the brain to play in the ever-changing horizontal space between past patterns and the indeterminacies of the future, the space that plots organize into beginnings, middles, and ends. Concord with no trace of discord would be disabling. In waking life, as neuroscientist Gerald Edelman observes, groups of neurons dynamically assemble and reassemble into continuously changing patterns of firing. The synchronization of brain waves across the cortex makes possible the formation of neural, neuronal assemblies and coordinates the workings of different regions of the brain. As cognitive scientists Bernard Bars and Nicole Gage explain, normal cognition requires selective local synchrony among brain regions, highly patterned and differentiated oscillatory patterns in which synchrony, desynchrony, and aperiodic one-shot waveforms constantly appear and disappear. But as Edelman explains, if a large number of neurons in the brain start firing in the same way, reducing the diversity of the brain's neuronal repertoires, as is the case in deep sleep and epilepsy, consciousness disappears. In those conditions, the slow oscillatory firing of distributed populations of neurons is highly synchronized globally, and global hypersynchrony paralyzes normal functioning by disrupting the to and fro of synchronization and desynchronization. In contrast to sleep and epilepsy, consciousness requires not just neural activity, Edelman points out, 
but neural activity that changes continually and is thus temporally and spatially differentiated, distributed, integrated, but continuously changing patterns of neural activity whose rich, rich functioning actually requires variability. The ability of a plot to join concord and discord through temporal structures that order events while holding them open to surprise, variation, and refiguration is one instance of this necessary tension between pattern and change, synchrony and fluctuation, coordination and differentiation. Stories set in motion, reciprocal processes of pattern formation that are always already occurring beneath our awareness and that are fundamental to the brain's operation as a to and fro ensemble of neuronal assemblies that are constantly coming and going, waxing and waning. The concordant discordances of narrative play off of the brain's necessary, never-ending alternation between synchronization and desynchronization. By manipulating the time lags built into cognition, narratives can, re uh, can reinforce established patterns through the pleasures of recognition and immersion, providing support for the structures that build coherence across our temporal experience, or they can disrupt the expectations through which we build consistency and thereby make possible new patterns of synchronization. The conjunctions that smooth over temporal discordances can facilitate configurative activity, but the disjunctions inherent in these time lags can also be productive by combating habitualization and promoting flexibility. The temporality of the decentered brain makes mimesis or imitation possible because imitation is not a static correspondence of sign to thing, but a dynamic coordination of an action. Aristotle famously claims that tragedy is an imitation not of men, but of action. And further, that performers act not in order to imitate character, they take on character for the sake of imitating actions. Narration is a kind of action, a linguistic making, that produces an organization of events, an allotment of actions, that the reader or listener follows and reconstructs, the activity of comprehension. Contemporary neuroscience suggests that the biological basis of these connections is an action perception circuit that makes action fundamental to many cognitive processes that might seem unrelated to the control of various body parts by the motor cortex. Seeing, hearing, and touching are all active processes, for example, that are especially attuned to difference and change. For all modes of perception, exploratory activity provides ever-changing information about regularities and irregularities in the environment, and it is these differences to which the organism responds. Plots can play a central role in structuring our understanding of the world because action is thoroughly implicated in perception and cognition. Recent experimental action on the responsiveness of the brain to imagined action and even to action words suggests that the brain is primed to respond to linguistically staged configurations of action, and these can have a profound effect on our cognitive processes because perception in many different modalities, vision, hearing, smell, touch, depends on embodied action. As neuroscientist Mark Generod points out, many different experiments have shown that imagining a movement relies on the same mechanisms as actually performing it. If the motor cortex and even muscle tissue can be excited by mental rehearsal of an action, that should also be true of linguistic simulations of action, and there's experimental evidence that this is so. Action seems to perform a fundamental role in coordinating different modalities of cognition, 
And this organizing role is crucial not only for lack action, not only for language, but also for narrative and for our ability to construct and follow plots. I think I've gotten my, my all right, so that's actually, my, I'm sorry, I've, the, the, I've messed up the coordination of my slides and my talk, I apologize. All right, now I'm back in order. All right, so action seems to perform a fundamental role in coordinating different modalities of cognition, and this organizing role is crucial not only for language but also for narrative and our ability to construct and follow plots. The anatomical region um, of the brain central to these interactions is Broca's area, a region of the inferior frontal cortex adjacent to the sections of the motor cortex that control the mouth and the lips. Studies have shown that this area is active in human action observation, action imagery, and language understanding. Impairments in Broca's area have long been known to result in difficulties producing and comprehending. I knew Windows is getting ready. Don't turn off your computer. Working on updates. 8%, 15% complete. Don't turn off your computer. 21, 24% complete. Don't turn off your computer. So. I hate Windows. I, thank you, Bill Gates. All right, so. Should I should just keep on going? All right, okay, all right. I had some pictures coming up, but you know, forget it. Um, so, impairments in Broca's area have long been known to result in difficulties producing and comprehending grammatical sentences. Patients with legions in this part of the brain can understand and pronounce single words but they have great difficulty in aligning scrambled words into a sentence or in understanding complex sentences. And these deficiencies are paralleled in non-linguistic modalities. A number of brain imaging studies have shown, for example, that musical syntax is processed in Broca's area and that listening to musical rhythms activates the motor cortex. This region of the, bra this region of the brain is also apparently crucial for narrative. An experiment by Patrick Fazio, F-A-Z-I-O, his name and the source were up there on a slide, uh, revealed that a lesion affecting Broca's area impairs the ability to sequence actions in a task with no explicit linguistic requirements. His group showed patients with Broca's aphasia short movies of human actions or physical events and they were then asked to order, in a temporal sequence, four pictures taken from each movie and randomly presented on the computer screen. Curiously, although these patients could still recognize before-after relations between physical events, they had a harder time reconstructing the order of human actions. Their ability to remember and compose a sequence of represented actions was impaired. This result suggests that the patients in Fazio's study suffered a deficiency in the capacity for implotment, the ability to produce and follow configurations of action. Such an inference is consistent with Fazio's claim that the complex pattern of abilities associated with Broca's area might have evolved from its pre-order function of assembling individual motor acts into goal-directed actions. This capacity for organizing action into meaningful sequences makes the brain ready for language, but it also prepares the brain for narrative. Broca's area is vital for language as well as for narrative because both entail the structuration of symbolic action. Our intuitive, bodily-based ability to understand the actions of other people is fundamental to social relations of many kinds, including the relation between storyteller, story, and audience. This ability undergirds the circuit between the representation of a configured action implotted in a narrative and the reader's or listener's activity of following the story as we assimilate its patterns into the figures that shape our worlds. In an illuminating analysis of what she calls the kinematics of narrative, 
And imagine the word spelled up there, K-I-N-E-M-A-T-I-C-S, kinematics. Cognitive literary theorist Guillemet Bolens, B-O-L-E-N-S, distinguishes between uh, kinesic intelligence and kinesthetic sensations. That is, our human capacity to discern and interpret body movements, kinesic intelligence, uh, as opposed to motor sensations, kines kinesthetic sensations, we may have of our own actions, whether voluntary or involuntary. She says, I cannot feel the kinesthetic sensations in another person's arm, yet I may infer his kinesthetic sensations on the basis of kinesic signals I perceive in his movements. In an act of kinesthetic empathy, I may internally simulate what these inferred sensations possibly feel like via my own kinesthetic memory and knowledge." End of quotation. So we're in about slide 28. Let me get there. Actually, slide 27. All right. So the ability to understand the, all right, there we go, just that one would be good. All right. So the ability to understand the actions represented in the story, what is told, as well as to follow the movements of the narration, the telling, requires both kinds of cognitive competence. The hermeneutic capacity to configure signals into meaningful patterns, there we go, kinesic intelligence, and the intuitive sense of how the structures and plotting the actions and the forms deployed in the narration resonate with my own unreflective, habitual modes of figuring the world embodied in my kinesthetic sensations. The kinesic intelligence and kinesthetic empathy that we use to understand stories entail a kind of doubling between self and other that according to Maurice Merleau-Ponty, makes the alter ego fundamentally paradoxical. As Merleau-Ponty explains, the social is already there when we come to know or judge it because the intersubjectivity of experience is primordially given with our experience, of a, with our perception of a common world. And yet, he continues, there's a solipsism rooted in living experience and quite insurmountable because I'm destined never to experience the presence of another person to herself. The kinesthetic empathy that Bolins describes is paradoxically both intersubjective and solipsistic, for example, inasmuch as I must internally simulate what the other must be feeling as if her sensations were my own, which, of course, they are not. Otherwise, I wouldn't need to infer them on the basis of my sensations. Following a story is similarly a paradoxical process with both intersubjective and solipsistic dimensions, whereby my own resources for configuring the world are put to work to make sense of another fictive narrated world that may seem both familiar and strange and that may either reinforce or disrupt my sense of the world's patterns because its figurations both are and are not analogous to mine. The doubling of self and other in the exchange of stories can have a variety of beneficial or potentially noxious social consequences. Following a story is a fundamentally collaborative transaction that can promote the shared intentionality that Michael Tomasello and other neurobiologically oriented cultural anthropologists identify as a unique human ability that, that other primates seem to lack. What Tomasello calls we intentionality is the capacity for participating in collaborative activities involving shared goals and socially coordinated action plans, joint intentions. The fundamental skills of cultural cognition made possible by shared intentionality begin with parent-infant proto-conversations that involve turn-taking and exchange of emotions. Activities also entailed, of course, in telling and following stories. And such collaborative interactions culminate 
in what is known as the ratchet effect of cumulative cultural evolution. This ability to engage in coordinated activity is analogous to what neuroscientists of music observe in the predisposition of infants to attend to melodic contour and rhythmic patterning of sound sequences and in their attunement to consonant patterns, melodic as well as harmonic and to metric rhythms. The comparison to music is instructive because rhythmically coordinated action beneath conscious and awareness can be both enabling and disabling. The sensation of boundaries dissolving and experiences of rhythmic interaction and harmonic unification, what Nietzsche famously attributed to Dionysian powers of music to overwhelm Apollonian line and form, may miraculously, even sublimely, transport us outside of ourselves, but it can also result in well-documented contagion effects. The shared thrills of an audience response at a concert, for example, or the collective enthusiasm of a crowd at a sports event or a political rally that disable cognitive capacities for criticism and evaluation. Although perhaps less sleepingly powerful, the experience of being carried away by a narrative may similarly transport the listener and seem to erase boundaries between worlds. Such an erasure of self-other differences may facilitate the inculcation of patterns of feeling and perceiving and have a more powerful impact on habitual pattern formation than cooler, less absorbing, less transportive exchanges of signs and information. The ideological workings of narrative, its ability to inculcate, perpetuate, and naturalize embodied habits of cognition and emotion are optimized as the knot in the doubling of self and other disappears. If stories ask us to suspend disbelief to immerse ourselves in the illusion they offer, this invitation may be, an invita uh, may be a temptation to the dissolution of boundaries and the, that the demystifying suspicions of ideology critique rightly resist in order to shake the hold on us of habits of thinking and feeling whose power we may not recognize because they are so deeply imagined, ingrained rather, familiarized and naturalized. The capacity of stories to facilitate beneficial social collaboration and to habitualize ideological mystification are two sides of the same coin. So much more briefly, uh, part two, consequences for narrative theory. Briefly, um, my argument is that the um, dominant model of cognitive narratology, which is uh, derived from structuralism still, assumes anatomical modularity in the brain and the universality of, of um, certain structures that are not consonant with the best neuroscience about desynchronization and desynchronization of neuronal assemblies and also don't give us the capacity to talk about pattern formation and openness to change that narrative interactions facilitate and more recent work in an active embodied cognitive uh, narratology trying to focus on those interactions is a better model for understanding how, neuros how narratives interact with experience in the brain and also I think more promising for the work of trauma theory where those interactions are what you care about. And I think one of the reasons why trauma theory, at least in my reading of it, hasn't done, dealt much with cog classical narrat narratology is that that emphasis on fixed, hum, uh, presumably homologous universal structures doesn't get at the kind of processes that trauma uh, research cares about. Um, how much time do I have left? Five minutes? All right, so um, I apologize for the, uh, I, I read this out without having translators, so I read it out much more quickly. My son tells me I speak too fast, and I think that's true, so I apologize. They're nodding in the back. Yep, you do. Um, so let me just briefly in five minutes suggest you know, the, the outlines of this, of this argument. The goal of classical narratology was to, de uh, was to instruct, construct the ideal taxonomy, the classificatory scheme that would identify the fundamental elements of narrative and their rules of combination based on how grammar and syntax determine meaning by establishing the structural relations between the constituent parts of a logical ordered system.
There's a growing scientific consensus, however, that the formalist model of innate, orderly, rule-governed structures for language should be cast aside because it does not fit with what we know about how the brain works. New versions of cognitive narratology have arisen to challenge the structuralist paradigm. And this is what I was talking about. As Karin Kukkonen and Marco Car Car Caracciolo explain, advocates of an embodied and active view of cognition argue that rather than conceiving of the mind as a structure of abstract propositional representations like frames and scripts, narrative theory should understand the human mind as shaped by our evolutionary history, bodily makeup, and sensory motor possibilities, and as arising out of close dialogue with other minds in intersubjective actions and cultural processes. Whereas first-generation cognitive science was firmly grounded in a computational view of the mind with frames, skip, scripts, and schemata functioning as mental representations that enable us to make sense of the world by serving as models of specific situations or activities, second-generation cognitive science shares with phenomenology and the pragmatism of Dewey and James an emphasis on the interactions between embodied cognition and the world in feedback loops through which experience shapes cultural practices, even as cultural practices help the mind make sense of bodily experience. Rather than prioritizing the construction of taxonomies, schemata, and systems of rules to explain how the mind works and to account for narrative by disclosing its underlying cognitive structures, Second-generation narratology insists on the situated, embodied quality of readers' engagement with stories and on how meaning emerges from the experiential interaction between texts and readers. Not everything, to be sure, in first-generation cognitive narratology need be abandoned. Manfred Jan describes seeing X as Y as a foundational axiom of cognitive narratology, and this idea is indeed scientifically sound. Configurative processes of categorization and pattern formation, what existential phenomenologist Martin Heidegger similarly calls the as structure of understanding, are crucial to cognition and narrative, but they need to be understood in non-schematized interactive form. It's a mistake to reify these cognitive processes into mental modules that bear no relation to the anatomy of the embodied brain or deposit linear models of cognitive decision making that do not correspond to the reciprocal to and fro movements of figuration in experience, in the cortex, or in the interactions between brain, body, and world seeing as sets in motion interactions between brain, body, and world that are fluid, reciprocal, and open-ended, and preset schemata like frames and scripts are too rigid and linear to do justice to these sorts of dynamic recursive processes. Seeing as is not located in any particular cortical region, but extends across brain, body, and world. It's not developed by rule, governed by rules, but develops through repeated experiences um, that, one more minute, yep, establish habitual patterns open to disruption and change. The brain is a bushy ensemble of anatomical features that are only partly fixed by genetic inheritance, but is uh, also plastic in varying degrees. The key uh, neurobiological concept uh, underlying this uh, mo a model is Hebb's law, neurons that fire together, wire together. Um, brain order is, emerges from the habitual formation of patterns through regularities of experiences and is not based on uh, pre-existing anthropological modules or uh, computer-like rules. Uh, it's due less to inher innate inherited structures than to statistical regularities of experience. And I strongly recommend this book, The Neural Ar Ar Architecture of Grammar, by Steve, uh, neuroscientist Stephen Adu that works the argument out in much more technical detail. Briefly then, language needs to be understood as a biocultural hybrid 
uh, with, uh, uh, there's no universal grammar module in the brain, but language taps the entire brain through the syntheses um, uh, that uh, experience uh, uh, creates through heavy and wiring and firing, and the disruptions that the desynchronization of those neuronal assemblies uh, make possible as we respond uh, to new experiences. Uh, narrative uh, universals, if they exist, are a result of reg regularities in the experience across cultures based on our, our uh, biologically shared equipment. It's, both, it's neither nature nor, nor nurture, it's both. And in, in order to be able to describe those, one needs not a structural model of the brain um, and an, an attempt to locate uh, uh, rules of operation analog anal on the analogy of grammar, uh, one needs to understand how narratives participate in the formation and dissolution of patterns in the embodied brain's interactions with the world. So thank you very much.